All right. Well, thank you for joining me today in our continuing flow cytometry webinar series. Our previous webinars are available on our website for viewing and PDF download. My name is Jolene Bradford. I am the Research and Development Associate Director of Flow Cytometry Systems, which is located in Eugene, Oregon, the home of molecular probes. Before I start the presentation, I have a few announcements. Um, first, you can submit questions during the presentation. Um, I'll try to answer as many of these as time allows at the end of the presentation. I also have technical experts in the room with me that will be able to answer your questions during the webinar itself. Um, still, there may be questions that are unanswered during the webinar, and I will answer those after the webinar has ended. Today's webinar is part of a series that will continue throughout 2012, and the second on the basics of flow cytometry. On April 17th, we will present a webinar highlighting microbiology and flow cytometry, and this will be presented by my colleague, Barbara Saradek. So let's begin. Today we'll cover some of the basic fluorescent immunophenotyping reagents used, different scaling options for data presentation, the principle of compensation, including the use of controls and how to perform. We'll cover strategies for designing a flow cytometry experiment and discuss data presentation. Immunophenotyping is the most common application used in flow cytometry. So let's begin with an introduction to some common fluorescent molecules used in this application. We can study cellular characteristics of cells using flow cytometry through the use of fluorescent molecules, such as fluorophore-labeled antibodies, which is called immunophenotyping. In these experiments, the labeled antibody is added to the cell sample the antibody then binds to a specific molecule on the cell surface or inside the cell. The labeled cell suspension is drawn into a flow cytometer, and when laser light of the right wavelength strikes the fluorophore, a fluorescent signal is emitted, which is then detected by the flow cytometer. In this example, we see blue excitation light and green emission light. This is a diagram of a cell labeled with three different antibodies. Each antibody is labeled with a different fluorophore. The fluorescently labeled antibody will bind to its corresponding antigen on the cell. When the antibody is conjugated directly to the fluorophore like this, we call it a directly labeled antibody. So here we see three different antibodies, CD3, CD4, and CD8 all common human T cell markers. The CD3 antibody is labeled with FIPSI, the CD4 antibody is labeled with PE, and the CD8 antibody is labeled with PERCP. The emission spectra of all three of these fluorophores is shown on the right with the bandpass filter found on the flow cytometer used to collect the emitted light for each. All three can be excited with the common 488 nanometer laser but they have distinct enough emissions to allow their simultaneous use on the same sample. The ability to easily detect more than one marker in the same sample, or the ability to multiplex, is one of the things that makes flow cytometry so powerful. So here we see examples of some of the common organic fluorophores used. Pacific Blue and Pacific Orange are both excited by the Violet 405 laser. Alexafluor 488, FITSI, PE, and PERCP are all excited by the 488 blue laser, while APC and Alexafluor 647 are both excited by the red 635 laser source. The Alexafluor dyes have improved overall brightness or more optimal for physiologic pH and show reduced photobleaching. They're available at uh, a number of excitation and emission wavelengths covering the entire spectra, not just the two that are listed here. Uh, the name of the Alexa dye includes its best excitation wavelength. Tandem dyes were created to produce a molecule with longer stoke shift. A tandem dye is created when two fluorophores are coupled together in close association. The excitation of the donor dye is used which then transfers its energy to a nearby fluorescent molecule, which then emits. It's effective when the two dyes are in close proximity, 
between 10 and 100 angstroms. The emission spectra of the donor dye and the excitation spectra of the acceptor dye must over overlap for energy transfer to occur. Effectiveness of the tandem dye is dependent on the efficiency of this energy transfer. A fluorescent protein such as ATC, PE, or PERCP is used as the donor molecule, and organic dyes such as a psi dye or one of the alexafluor dyes are generally used as acceptor dyes. This is a graphic representation of a tandem dye and a listing of some of the common tandem combinations available. There are advantages to using tandems. They are very useful because they open up new regions of the spectra in the far red area. They have a large stoke shift and allow for more options within a single laser line. There are some disadvantages to using tandems as well. They are very photosensitive. So this means that the storage is critical and you do need to minimize exposure to light during cell labeling and acquisition. Tandems cannot, can be easily dissociated and the donor dye fluorescence can escape, which makes compensation more difficult. And finally, lot-to-lot -lot variation is high, so it is recommended that the same lot of tandem dye be used for compensation purposes. Q-dot nanocrystals are small semiconductor crystals, generally 2 to 10 nanometers in diameter, and they have unique fluorescent properties. Emission wavelength depends on particle size. The smaller the particle, the shorter the emission wavelength. Nanocrystals generally emit light of a very narrow wavelength and are extremely photostable. One of the most important distinctions in the optical properties of quantum dots is that they have a very large stoke shift, or the distance between the excitation and the emission wavelength. In general, Organic dye molecules have emission maxima close to their excitation maxima, so it is difficult to resolve more than one or two dyes off of a given excitation store, source without using a tandem construct. By contrast, Q-dot nanocrystals are most efficiently excited in the UV to violet region and have discrete emissions. The Q-dot emission peak is narrow and symmetrical, and they are very photostable. The different fluorophore types have unique advantages and disadvantages, so researchers usually end up using all types to develop their multicolor panel. It's recommended that a spectra viewer be used to see how different fluorophores can fit into your instrument and your panel. Organic dyes are available in a variety of conjugates and are relatively stable. They can be used in pretty much any instrument configuration. The disadvantage is the small stoke shift that these molecules have, which means that multiple excitation lasers must, must be used. Uh, fluorescent proteins are bright, here PE and APC. They are available in a variety of conjugates and can be used in most instrument configurations, but there are limited color options. Tandem conjugates have a longer stoke shift, and this brings more color options. However, issues include tandem stability, which can cause increased compensation in the donor dye detector, and there is often lot-to-lot -lot variability. Nanocrystals have a bright signal, a large stoke shift, and narrow emission peaks. And with a single excitation laser, there is little to no compensation required. Disadvantages include availability of direct conjugates and the need for cross-laser compensation in multi-laser systems. So now, let's shift to a discussion of scaling of plots. Once data has been collected, we can use histograms or dot plots to graphically represent the data. Each of these plots can be generated using, using linear scaling or using logarithmic scaling, also called log scaling. Here, lymphocytes are stained with a fluorescently labeled antibody reacting to the CD4 cell surface antigen. If we use linear scaling in histograms for this type of data, it's difficult to see both the CD4 positive and negative populations at the same time, as displayed on the left. The CD4 negative population is compressed against the axes. Switching the fluorescence to a log scale, as seen on the right, 
allows both populations to be clearly seen on the same plot. Conversely, in an experiment to measure DNA content in cells, we're dealing with a narrow range of fluorescent values. When this data is displayed on a log scale, as seen on the right, important subtle differences may be obscured. When the same data are plotted on a linear scale, as seen in the plot on the left, the specific distribution of DNA amounts is much more apparent. There is a newer type of scaling that uses components of both the log and the linear together. Depending on the software used, this type of display can be called by different names, including log transform, bi-exponential, logical, hyperlog, and linlog display. This scale transitions from logarithmic scaling at the upper end to linear scaling at the lower end. Most newer instruments and software offer this type of linlog display. Uh, the LINLOG plots have become more common with the growing number of digital cytometers that have electronics that can assign fluorescent values below zero. These data may not display properly using standard logarithmic scaling, although the calculated statistics should still be correct. In the traditional log display, the events will pile up on the axes, as seen here in the right plot. They are hidden from view. All of the events cannot be visualized. With the LINLOG display as shown on the left, the hidden events can now be visualized and all of the data can be seen. Here is another example showing log versus LINLOG display. In both of these plots, the y-axis is displayed in LINLOG. However, the x-axis is different. On the left plot, the x-axis is shown using logarithmic scale, and some of the events are not visible. In the plot on the right, the x-axis uses the LINLOG scaling, and all of the events are visualized. Being able to visualize the entire population allows for proper, proper interpretation of the data and helps to understand if compensation values have been properly applied. The spectral overlap occurs when the light emitted from one floor four emits into the detector, which measures the fluorescent signal being emitted by another fluorophore. The potential consequence of this is a false positive signal. It's possible to eliminate this by electronically removing the signal through a process called compensation. The concept of compensation continues to be one of the aspects of flow cytometry, which is confusing. Although many instruments and software packages can perform automated compensation for researchers, it's still important to understand the basic principles. Compensation is a process by which spillover fluorescence is removed from secondary parameters so that the fluorescent values for a parameter reflect only the fluorescence of the primary fluorophore. In a perfect world, the fluorescence emission profile for each individual fluorophore would be very intense a narrow peak, and separated well from the other emission peaks. In reality, however, fluorophores have broader emission peaks, as you can see here from the emission profiles of Alexa Fluor 488 and RPE. For proper interpretation of the data collected, we need to be sure that the fluorescent light recorded for the Alexa dye is coming from the Alexa dye and not from RPE. To accurately record the fluorescent signal for a given fluorophore, we need to correct the emission signal, and this correction is called compensation. The flow cytometer records fluorescence using an emission filter chosen to collect the maximum amount of light from the fluorophore of interest and to exclude as much light as possible from the other fluorophores. Here we see Alexa Fluor 488 fluorescence collected with a 530 nanometer bandpass filter and RPE fluorescence collected with a 585 nanometer bandpass filter. While each of these filters effectively captures the emission peak of the target fluorophore, each bandpass also collects a bit of light from the other flora due to spectral overlap in the emission profiles. This overlap is shown here in red.
For this pair of fluorophores, the amount of spectral overlap of the alexafluor 488 dye into the RPE detection bandpass is greater and requires more compensation than the amount of spectral overlap from RPE into the Alexa detection channel. In order to see the amount of compensation required to correct the fluorescence, we need single color samples. Either aliquots of the cell samples stained with each fluorophore separately, or microspheres that capture an individual reagent, or it can also be a combination of these. So we'll start with the Alexa Fluor 488 labeled cell. With a single color control, we have cells which are labeled with the Alexa dye only. This is a two parameter plot with the PE fluorescence displayed on the Y axis. We see both a positively labeled population with a bright fluorescence and a negative population. This is what a single stained sample that is properly compensated should look like. This is what a single stained sample looks like that does not have compensation applied. These same cells also emit fluorescence into the RPE channel, which results in a apparent upward shift of this population when there is no compensation applied. The signal occurs because the tail of the Alexa dye has the right wavelength range to be collected in the RPE detector. This incidental collection of Alexa 4 488 fluorescence in the RPE detector would erroneously increase the amount of RPE signal assigned if left uncorrected. Although this signal is real, we are detecting real fluorescence from light coming from the Alexa dye. It cannot be correctly assigned to the presence of an RPE label. For meaningful data analysis, the emission values must be corrected for the spectral overlap. The Alexa Fluor 488 labeled population is compensated so that the mean fluorescent values in both the positive and negative populations are equal in the RPE channel. Practically, this is performed for each event by subtracting the percentage of the fluorescence. This is what a single stain sample looks like that does not have compensation, or it has 0% compensation. As we begin to apply increasing amounts of compensation, we will see the positive population move until the means of the positive and negative population in the PE channel are equal. We are approaching this by applying 10% compensation, but that is not enough. As we apply more compensation, now at 20%, it's still not fully compensated. Now, with 30% compensation applied, the Y means of both the positive and the negative populations of the Alexa-labeled cells are equal, indicating the data are properly compensated. There will be a spread of values around that mean. To determine the amount of compensation for each fluorophore, control samples stained with each single color are analyzed in parallel with the experimental samples. So here's another way to help understand compensation by using imaging cytometry combined with typical flow cytometry plots. The sample collected here has four colors, FITSI, PE, RCP, Sci-Fi.5, and APC. In the dot plots on the left, we see the typical diagonal populations typically seen when the data is not compensated. In the cell images on the right, without any compensation, the fluorescent spillover or bleed through is seen in the fluorescent channels adjacent to the channel used to collect the main fluorescence of each fluorophore. By using four singly labeled controls, compensation was determined and applied to this sample. The dot plots now show the populations nicely separated, and the fluorescence in the images is now seen in just one detection channel each. Let's go over how to perform compensation. So first, you'll need a negative control. This is used to mimic the background fluorescence. Uh, the background fluorescence includes, includes autofluorescence, any nonspecific binding, and non-antigen-specific binding. The positive fluorescence will be relative to the negative. 
the negative control can be unlabeled cells or it can be a microsphere or a bead. To set compensation properly, the use of single color positive controls are required. Each fluorophore used in the experiment, uh, a sample with just one fluorophore is prepared and the fluorescence is collected in all detection channels used in the experiment. That way, the fluorescent spillover into the detector channels can be determined. It does need to be the same fluorophore. For example, APC and Alexa 647 are two fluorophores that are collected in the same detector, but the spectra of the two are different and will produce different compensation values. If you're using a tandem dye, it's recommended to use the exact same lot of tandem due to the variability of making the tandem itself. Different lots of, of tandems can produce different compensation values. Beads or cells can be used for different positive controls. Um, using the same cells that are being tested in the experiment can be used. However, this can be problematic if there is a low or absent expressing antigen. Antibody capture beads can be used, and these do provide some advantages. It uses the exact same uh, reagent. Uh, the exact same lot. There are a lot of positive events and they are very bright. Compensation controls much, must be matched to each experiment and must be at least as bright as the reagent used in the experiment. The antibody capture beads provide a consistent, accurate, and easy to use technique for setting compensation. These are available in mouse and rat hamster kits. Uh, they contain two types of specially modified polystyrene microspheres and bind all types of uh, isotypes of mouse or rat hamster immunoglobulin. Uh, the negative beads have no antibody binding capacity. The use of antibody capture beads for compensation has several advantages. The antibody capture beads can replace cells, um, and this is an advantage when the cells are scarce or precious. And the antibodies are captured on beads without regard to specificity, so a bright and uniform signal is obtained regardless of uh, the cells used. The amine reactive compensation kit, or ARC kit, is designed to facilitate compensation when using any of the eight live dead fixable dead cell stains, which are all amine reactive dyes. This kit provides two types of polystyrene microspheres, the arc reactive beads that bind any of the amine reactive dyes and the negative beads which have no reactivity. The ABC beads and the arc beads can be used in combination in a multicolor experiment that incorporates uh, antibody labeling and a dead cell discriminator. So putting this all together um, for the Linlog display, here we see a single color control on the upper left without compensation. On the upper right, the data is properly compensated, but since it is shown in log scale, some of the events are not visible. On the lower right, with the lin log scale, all of the data are visible, and this shows the advantage of using the lin log scaling for compensation. So uh, a summary for controls used in compensation. Single color sample for each color in the experiment is used in which the positive is at least as bright as the experimental sample. Positive needs to be spectrally matched to the experimental reagent and ideally the same reagent and in the case of the tandem dye, the same lot of tandem. And the positive and negative, or you could use a less bright instead of a negative, these are matched for uh, fluorescence background or autofluorescence. So this brings us to our first polling question. This is a true or false question, and you can respond as soon as you are able. Uh, when using DFP in a multicolor experiment, ITSI can be used as a single color compensation control. Is this true or is this false? When using GFP in a multicolor experiment, ITSI can be used as a single color compensation control. So if you can respond now, I'll uh, have the uh, surveys uh, 
either true or false. And I'll give you five, four, three, two, one. And from this, uh, the response, we have 77% uh, say false and 23% uh, say true. And the answer to this is actually false. The single color control needs to be spectrally matched to the experimental reagent. And although GFP and FITC are used in the same detector channel, the emission spectra for each of these are different. So it is best to use GFP positive cells for proper compensation when using GFP. So let's discuss some basics in designing a flow cytometry experiment. Regular advances in reagents and instrumentation for flow cytometry allow the researcher to run increasingly complex multicolor experiments. There are many benefits, including that a single cell is interrogated with multiple markers, giving a better definition of population, and data from multiple analytes can be correlated. This has an efficiency. Fewer samples are required, which means the amount of sample required is less, and it gives a higher throughput. Measuring more colors does mean the complexity of the testing increases, and there is more optimization that is required with a greater attention of detail. This increased complexity requires a more strategic appro approach to experiment design, especially when choosing which fluorophore to pair with each antibody. Here we see a broad range of dyes that are commonly used in flow cytometry. The most common listed here are those which are excited by the three most common laser lines, 488, 635, and 405 nanometers. With so many fluorophores to choose from, it's easy to find one that excites and emits in any segment of the spectrum, but it is still important to pair the best antibody with the correct fluorophore for the panel. How does one go about picking antibody combinations? Reagent for Reagent selection for the panel begins with an understanding of the configuration of the instrument to be used. Laser excitation wavelengths and detector numbers will guide the use of a particular fluorochrome and combination. The selection of the fluorochrome is based on the excitation, emission, and spectral overlap between the fluorophores and the availability of direct antibody combinations. It's not a simple mix and match to making the best combination. So let's discuss some of the methods that can be used. Separation of the positive from the negative signal can be affected by a number of items. A simple method to measure the separation is taking the mean or medium fluorescence intensity, or MFI, of the positive peak divided by the MFI of the negative peak. This is the signal to background ratio. The effective brightness of a particular fluorophore depends on both the intensity difference between the positive and negative events, but also on the spread of the negative population. As the spread of the negative population increases, the separation from the positive decreases. The staining index measurement takes into account the spread of the negative. The calculation for the stain index is the mean of the positive minus the mean of the negative divided by two times the standard deviation of the negative. In the simplest terms, the stain index is a parameter which reflects the ability to resolve a dim population signal from background. So here are 25 different fluorophores, each labeled with a CD4 antibody. This comes from a study used to evaluate the performance of each fluorophore and includes organic dyes and quantum dot nanocrystals as well. Uh, you'll notice that each has a different separation of positive from negative, and this can be attributed mainly to the fluorophore used since the same target is being detected. And it shows that the relative brightness of each fluorophore is different. To illustrate the relative brightness of each conjugate, staining index was calculated. This chart shown here takes these conjugates and lists them from the highest staining index to the lowest. 
This indicates that some dyes have a low staining index and they should not be used with low abundance markers. However, even a dim dye can be effect an effective part of a panel as long as it is carefully matched to the appropriate antibody. So understanding the relative brightness of commonly used dyes and a knowledge of the antigen expression are crucial elements to ensure your accuracy. So depending on many factors, including laser power, emission filter, and instrument which they are used, um, in addition, uh, fluorophore brightness, there are several things to keep in mind when designing a flow experiment. Of course, know the configuration of the instrument being used and select fluorophores that are compatible with the instrument. Use dim fluorophores when the antibodies are highly expressing antigens. Use bright fluorophores with antibodies to low expressing antigens. Um, use a spectra viewer to uh, help define the dye selection and understand the spectral overlap of fluorophores. Protect vials from light to avoid light degradation, and this is especially important with the use of tandems and protect labeled cells from light to minimize photo bleaching effects. Another type of control that is used is the fluorescence minus one, or FMO control. This control contains all of the fluorophores in the experiment except the one of interest. There is one FMO control for each color used. The FMO control contains the fluorescence contribution to the negative population from the other dyes in the experiment. The compensated data may result in an un unexpected distribution or spread of data that precludes the adjustment of the signal to the level of the autofluorescence found in the unlabeled cells. So the use of staining controls that include all reagents except for the one of interest allows for a precise definition of the delineation of positive and negative populations. So here is an example of how useful the FMO control is used for marker placement. This shows a three-color experiment with FITSI, PE, and PESI-5. Compensation was set using single-color controls. The FMO control here contains both the FITSI and the PESI-5 dyes, but is without PE and is displayed in the middle plot. The unstained cells are shown in the plot on the left, and the fully labeled cells with all floors is shown on the right. You'll notice there is a high, higher fluorescence intensity with the FMO minus PE control as compared to the unstained cells. So the FMO control contains all of the fluorescence contribution to the negative population from the FITSI and PE dyes in the experiment. The marker placement to define the positive events is better determined with the FMO control instead of unlabeled cells. In the experimental design, several controls are needed to ensure accurate results, compensation, fluorescence minus one, and biological. Again, compensation can be performed using cells, antibody capture beads, or a combination of both, and requires the use of the same reagents used in the experiment. Compensation is best set using software as opposed to compensation manually using graphics. Compensated data may result in an unexpected distribution or spread of data that precludes the adjustment of the signal uh, with the autofluorescence, and this is why FMO controls are used to allow the precise definition of positive and negative populations. Uh, isotype controls are antibodies that have no specificity for target within a particular experiment, yet retain the nonspecific characteristics of the antibodies used in the experiment. Although widely used in the past, their use now is somewhat controversial. The isotype control antibody ideally matches the primary antibody's host species, isotype, and conjugation format to assess the level of specific staining. FMO controls are much more accurate for marker placement than using an isotype control. And finally, biological controls that provide biologically relevant information should be used to ensure sample preparation, staining, compensation, and gating are being performed as expected. So in panel design, there are several things to think about. 
How many colors do you really need? More colors means more complexity and more problems. Fluorophores collection. Put dim fluorophores on antibodies with the best resolved populations, brightest fluorophores on antibodies with the worst resolved populations, and consider spectral overlap. Try to use heavily overlapping fluorophores on mutually exclusive antibodies. You can use the same fluorophore for unwanted markers or lineage markers in a dump channel, and you can also add dead cells into this dump channel. Adding fluorophores from a different laser can help to decrease spectral overlap issues. They include compensation controls, FMO controls, and a known positive control. So this brings us to our second polling question. This is another true or false question. All fluorophores produce the same intensity of emitted light. Is this true or false? All fluorophores produce the same intensity of emitted light. So you can select your answer now. This is a true or false question. All fluorophores produce the same intensity of emitted light. I'll give you 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And 95% uh, of the audience has correctly identified false as the answer, and 5% have identified true. Um, the correct answer is false. Different fluorophores have different degree of brightness, and the staining index can be used to calculate the or to measure the relative brightness. So we'll finish up by discussing, discussing guidelines for data presentation. There are recommended standards which are published on best practices for presentation of flow cytometry data. These uh, recommendations help a consistent presentation style and ensure consistent communication of data to readers and listeners. Uh, it uses a common language and allows for faster interpretation. It helps provide a level of confidence that the data has been appropriately generated and analyzed and it allows reviewers and readers to focus on the point of the presentation. A standard for outlining the minimum information required to report experimental details of flow cytometry experiments is pub published in Cytometry A. Um, this is a recommendation of the International Society for Analytic Cytometry, or ISAC. I have included several links here about uh, information on data, data presentation if you're interested. I'll discuss four basics. The first is experimental and sample information. This includes a detailed description of the experimental design and preparation of cell suspension samples to be analyzed by flow cytometry. This description may include the number of independent experiments performed and the number of samples analyzed within each experiment, such as duplicates or triplicates. Details of how the cell suspensions were prepared for analysis are necessary to judge what the corresponding appropriate controls may be that are needed for analysis. Such details should include specific proteases used in cell isolation, approaches to single cell suspensions such as um, red cell lysis, uh, permeability uh, reagents, uh, as well as fixatives used. All fluorescent reagents should be included in the methods, including vendors, catalog numbers, and clone designations. And it's often useful to have these listed in a table. Um, the second describes the parameters used during the data acquisition. Methodology should include the description of the flow cytometer instrument used, the manufacturer model and software, the laser lines and optical emission filters used for the corresponding fluorescent reagents should also be used. Uh, this is an example of the type of information about the flow cytometry configuration and fluorophores used in each detector. Uh, what is shown is the configuration of the attuned acoustic cytometer with the red and blue laser configuration. Data analysis and presentation to represent cell population of interest are important 
The gating scheme should be outlined and include all scatter gates, live dead gates, singlet gates, and fluorescence detecting gates. The use of unstained controls, biological controls, isotope controls, fluorescent minus one, or the use of an internal negative population present within the sample should be listed. Information should be presented about approaches to compensation and specify how multicolor compensation was performed, including antibodies, cells, or beads. Um, report whether the statistical analysis represents a comparison among mean, median, or percentage values, and report the software package used to perform the analysis. And finally, data presentation. Um, there are following suggestions for presenting flow data plots. Both axes of the plot should be labeled, and proper quantitation for linear or logarithmic scales should be displayed. It's expected that the plots are labeled with the antibody and the fluorochrome rather than instrument-specific parameter description. For example, um, you could label it CD4550 rather than FL1. Percentages can be listed in the region. In addition to the flow plot, these data may also be compiled into a table format for ease of interpretation. Now, plots should avoid piling up of events on the axis or any sort of hidden values. You can adjust the scale if necessary to provide a different scale if appropriate, for example, changing from log logarithmic to len log. Uh, the number of total events in a plot should be displayed or listed in the figure legend. So here I've listed three very good references for the guidelines on the presentation of flow data. And with that, I'd like to invite you to download the free flow cytometry reagent mobile app. Uh, the flow cytometry resource center contains more educational resources for your use and uh, invite you to visit our Flow Facebook page. We now have over 11,000 followers. And that brings us to the end of this webinar. Um, please go ahead and submit uh, any further questions that you have. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'd like to remind you about our next webinar on April 17th, which is on microbiology applications in flow cytometry. So there is a question about um, if you think there is no spectral overlap between two fluorophores based on uh, what your observation is from the spectra viewer, should there still be compensation used? Um, it's always a good idea to do compensation, and uh, even if it's just 1% uh, applied, it will give you a, a better value. Um, so it's always uh, my recommendation that uh, you do compensation if you have more than one color. I would like to remind you again that this um, uh, PowerPoint presentation will be downloadable within a couple of hours, so you will be able to uh, get all of the, the slides. Um, there are some questions about uh, isotype controls and um, uh, if they're, you know, why is the use of isotype control somewhat controversial? And um, part of this is that the isotype control um, is meant to be used uh, with a number of different uh, antibody combinations. And uh, the, uh, it's, it's best used with the same lot of dye and the same F to P or fluorescence protein ratio. Uh, most vendors do not give that information out, um, so it becomes um, not as helpful. And once again, I would recommend using FMO controls instead. There's a question, if the emission filter of a cytometer is changed, do I need to change the controls again? Um, yes, that is a good idea, um, because the compensation will depend on a number of factors, including uh, the emission filter and the amount of dye that is collected into a particular um, uh, detection channel. So there's another question about using isotype controls and FML, FML controls together. 
So instead of using um, uh, fluorescence minus one, you can use an isotype control in the um, uh, FMO uh, instead. And it's been my experience that that really has not been more helpful than just a, an FMO control by itself, and it just um, adds more cost and complexity to your experiment. So there is a question, how is MFI calculated? Uh, this is um, the mean fluorescence or median fluorescence intensity, and this is a value that is uh, calculated by the flow cytometer and the software um, system. Um, there's a question about a demo video of compensation. I would invite you to um, visit our website. We do have several um, uh, tutorials that cover um, different aspects of flow cytometry, and that might be helpful to do those. Um, let me see. There's a question uh, about using a bright sample for compensation control. Um, so, for example, with a CD56, which is a very dim expressing marker, um, it's not very good to use those cells because your compensation will probably be uh, miscalculated. It'll be undercompensated. And you, in fact, want to use a, a brighter sample in this case. Um, there's another question about using uh, the ABC beads for live dead fixable stains. So again, these are compensation controls that can be used with the live dead fixable dead cell stains. Uh, I remind you that it's a good idea to exclude dead cells from your experiment uh, because dead cells can non-specifically bind antibodies. And uh, uh, so it's good to um, eliminate them from your experiment. Uh, but they do need to be compensated, and uh, the ABCBs can be used for that purpose. Uh, there's a question, is direct labeling better than indirect? Um, that's a, an interesting question. I don't know that one is better than the other. Uh, typically, indirect labeling will result in a slightly brighter separation of positive from negative. However, it's much more cumbersome to do and requires uh, a number of additional wash steps, so that the number of cells that you lose in each wash, wash step will affect your results. Um, people in flow cytometry tend to use direct labeled antibodies um, because it allows for an easier multicolor setup. If you do um, an indirect label, um, you have to do it systematically, and it takes much longer. Uh, there's a question about standard dichroic filters that are used in the flow system, and I'll have to refer you to the, uh, the flow cytometer that you are using in particular. Uh, typically, each one will have a standard set that are used to, uh, to QC the instrument and make sure that it's functioning properly. Um, some sy systems are fixed and will not allow um, the system to be changed, while others are more flexible and will allow the um, dichroic filters and band pass filters to be changed. There's another question. Can an isotype control be used to correct the fluorescence intensity due to size difference? Um, no. Uh, you'll need a, a positive uh, control for that. And fluorescence intensities um, due to size difference um, there may be, uh, an isotype really isn't going to be helpful there. Uh, there will be more uh, potential background fluorescence or autofluorescence because of different sizes of the cell, um, and that can just be detected without um, an isotype. So, so that does bring us to the end of the presentation. Once again, thank you for your attention. And I hope you join us again on April 17th.